So for those of you that are uh, present, you understand why I have a little fur on my lip. Uh, for those of you that are not present or watching this via video, could you imagine what that would look like? Uh, you see a little fur on my, my face, and I would like to say that I can grow a mustache in two days, uh, but I can't. This is uh, a gift from uh, the students that are here. We have an alumni summit that was last week, and then we have what's called an alumni extension where we have a lot of our students that stay on and just have a time of focus on Christ. It's a really beautiful week, but for whatever reason, the idea of mustaches uh, came up. And so I was supplied a mustache. I didn't even look in the mirror, uh, you know, so I have no idea if I grew my mustache well this morning. In fact, I feel like it's a little, uh, yeah, there we go. Maybe that helped. I can't tell. Uh, so I don't even know what I look like. I could be a very dashing man uh, at present. <laughs> So uh, whether or not I will wear this the whole time, at least I figured, and that, and we decided that that would be a lesson to all the people that don't come live and just listen via podcast, you know, the cheaters out there, that they don't go through the exercise of making it to Windsor. They don't get to participate in it. They don't, like some of you have a mustache on right now, and they don't. If they were here, they'd probably have the privilege of that. But uh, what a great delight it's been just to be with you guys, to share this time, uh, and uh, this particular uh, message uh, is part 20. It's, oh, I love round numbers when you get to uh, a round number, and part 20 is funny because I was in the teens, so it seemed like forever. But uh, I know it's not the most attractive title uh, when, you, when you look at it, and you know, I had to try and weigh that one uh, because there is a devious movement in this uh, that needs to be enunciated, but this is a very real piece of real estate in France. Uh, I think it would probably be translated as the dragon cavern or the dragon lair, uh, maybe better than the dragon hole, but the way the Germans say it sounds very similar to dragon hole, and so that's uh, the reason it ended up being uh, part 20, uh, the dragon hole. So we just finished up what's called the Battle of the Marne, which we spent a good deal of time on. In fact, I think we were joking that the amount of time spent in uh, the first, what would be the first month of the war, we spent about a month and a half <laughs> going through it, which is quite an interesting thought because it seems like all we're doing is giving a skim milk version of it anyways. But there is so much that is taking place here, and there are so many nations and so many participants in this uh, that it's a very, very significant time. And this is going to be the shift point uh, where we go from the Germans and their initial attack and their Schlieffen plan to take Paris in 39 days. At the Battle of the Marne, they are going to forsake their initial plan, which is a huge turning point in this. And the defensive uh, measures of the war are going to escalate. You have the French who have the cult of the offensive, and you have the Germans who have the Schlieffen plan. Both are offensive maneuvers. Both are going to fail, and it's going to lead to this Battle of the Marne, which is then going to lead to where we're at right now. And the nature of war is going to shift in history. I mean, literally right at this exact juncture, we are never going to return to the old school version of war. We are now entering into a new season. Uh, I don't know that any of you are taking me seriously with my mustache on. So, and I think it's even peeling off, which is going to cause some of you to think that uh, it's not a real mustache. Uh, but Daniel, could you, could you take this from me? Uh, and that was quite the privilege to have that mustache for a season. I am freshly shaven. Some of you are like, what's different about you? Did you cut your hair? Or what, did, was it a beard? What was it? No, I shaved my mustache. Uh, that, that's what happened. So the Battle of the Marne is September 6th through 12th. And depending on how, how good you guys are with calendar, June 28th was Gavrilo Princip's gunshot uh, when he killed Franz Ferdinand uh, in Sarajevo. July 28th, is going to be this key day when Hungary, I'm sorry, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. And Russia is going to mobilize in response of defense of Serbia. When Russia mobilizes, that's going to cause Germany then to declare war 
uh, and they're going to declare war in the funniest places. For instance, one of them is going to be on France. It's like, what does France have to do with this? But if you followed this, uh, this entire series, you sort of know why Germany's doing that. Germany has been anticipating this day. And then Germany is going to do what most people would call in world history one of the dumbest things ever done by any nation. That is, they are going to, ac to accomplish their plan, which is called the Schlieffen Plan, which is to take Paris in 39 days. They need to do something, something rather ornery, and that is to invade through Belgium. But Belgium is a neutral country that Germany itself has vowed to protect. And instead, they are going to violate Belgium and create atrocities in Belgium because the Belgians are going to do something that the Germans aren't expecting. They're going to resist. And so as a result, uh, you're going to have something known in history as the rape of Belgium, which doesn't go well for the German reputation. And, but it looks up until just a few days ago in our storyline that the Germans had the French and the English right where it wanted them, and it was going to succeed in its maneuver to take Paris in 39 days. And yet, the impossible happens, and von Kluck, who's uh, the general of the First Army, which is going to sweep down into Paris, is going to turn left at the most inopportune time for the Germans, but at, in their mind, it made sense. And yet, it's going to actually open their flank, their right flank, to the British Expeditionary Force, to Manorese Army, and to Gallieni, who's in Paris, and they're going to strike that right flank, which is the Battle of the Marne, which is going to create chaos in the German ranks. And the Germans are going to end up, instead of conquering the French army and winning the day, they are going to go into retreat mode, which is, in a sense, forsaking their Schlieffen plan. They can no longer complete their Schlieffen plan, which is going to create domino effects because that's what they've prepared for for all these years, is the Schlieffen plan. There's no secondary plan. The Schlieffen plan is how it works. So when they go into retreat at the Battle of the Marne, everything sort of is like the shuffling of the deck. It's like, whoa, where, what do we have now? We have a totally different situation where the French and the British could have destroyed the Germans in this situation. That's how broken the German army is because of the Battle of the Marne. But the French and the English are out of ammunition. And the French and the English are barely hanging on. They're, they're like, they've been marching in retreat for 12 days and now suddenly they go on the offensive. They haven't eaten, they haven't slept. They are like withered up, but they have this newfound energy because the Germans are retreating, but they can't overcome them, even though if they had the strength at that exact moment, they could have ended the war. Instead, we end up where we're at right now. And this is a very, very important illustration that I have. And it's, it's, it's a tough one for me to land because there's so many different ways I could have spun this. And yet I'm choosing a very specific truth to draw out. We'll see how well it works. I'll grade myself maybe at the end. It's like, yeah, that was a bad idea. Or, oh, that really worked. So here's Winston Churchill discussing the Battle of the Marne. The soul of the French nation triumphed in this death struggle, and their armies, defeated on the frontier, turned after the long marches of retreat and attacked and fought with glorious and desperate tenacity. Don't you love a good Winston Churchill quote? So Barbara Tuckman says this, After the incomplete victory of the Marne, there followed the German retreat to the Aisne. So the Aisne is a river that goes uh, east and west, and they are going to retreat beyond it, and it's about 100 meters wide, speaking in European terms, uh, and as a result, it's somewhat of an obstacle, so the, the, the French and the British have to cross this, which is going to take some time, and meanwhile, the Germans are sort of setting up. They have to make a choice. What are we doing now? And so now there's another sub story that I'm thinking of diving a little into and fiddling with a little. And that is that Moltke, remember von Moltke, Gloomy Gus? Uh, he's sort of the head, the military chief. So you have like John French, who's the head of the military movements for the BEF or the British. Joseph Joffre, who's over the French. It's like he's the field marshal, the commander in chief. They call him the marshal. And then in Germany, you have the, the equivalent is going to be Helmuth von Molka. And he's a rather pessimistic character who's not very happy right now. In fact, his world has fallen to pieces at this exact moment. And he is going to be replaced. But the story of von Molka is sort of interesting to me, and I'm, I'm pondering using it as a piece of clay and working with it. 
But meanwhile, a new character is going to come in, and his name is Eric von Falkenheim. There's all sorts of Erics on the German side, which makes me feel a little awkward uh, when I make them the bad guy, right? And uh, so that's going to actually create a domino effect, too, because he's going to change the strategy of how the Germans are going to function. And he is going to adopt the German military machine at this exact time. And he's sort of one of those ruthless characters that, you know, Moltke, you sort of like the guy. If you were to separate him from being the head of the military, you know, and just play a game of chess with him, you'd think, what a fine gentleman. Eric von Falkenheim, I'm not exactly sure if you would have the same conclusion, okay? The, now, Ludendorff, Eric Ludendorff, who I've I had a whole me message on Eric Ludendorff, right, to prep you for my namesake, uh, and uh, he, he's not a healthy character. Eric von Ludendorff, if you haven't, or Eric Ludendorff, did I put a von in front of his name? Eric Ludendorff. Uh, and he's not a very healthy character either, which you will find out. I would, that was a foreshadow message that I gave uh, when it was called The Other Eric. And uh, I think a quote from Eric Ludendorff is this, I can only do two things. I can either love or hate, and I hate Falkenheim. Uh, it's like, oh, okay. So it, that, that breeds some, some great rapport amongst the German team uh, right there. But we have a German retreat to the Aisne. The German recalibration. So that's what I'm going to say. It's September 13th. They've been retreating. They get across the Aisne. And now they are in a position where they need to make a decision. Are we going to continue to retreat? Because our men are defeated. We don't have the ammunition. We haven't slept or eaten for days. We need to make a choice. Falkenheim is going to say, dig in, turn around and dig in. Don't give up another inch of soil because they're in French territory. It's like, let's claim the French territory. Let's take over their industrial uh, strength and let's start producing off of their resources to supply for this war. So they're going to turn and this is going to lead to something known as the Battle of the Aisne, okay? which is a historic moment, just like the Marne, because of what's going to take place there. So Winston Churchill says it this way. Now, this quote I'm going to repeat multiple times because it says something that is so profound spiritually. From the moment when the German hopes of destroying the French armies by a general battle and thus of ending the war at a single stroke had definitely failed, all the secondary and incidental objectives which hitherto they had rightly discarded became of immense consequence. As passion declined, material things resumed their values. The struggle of armies and nations having failed to reach a decision, places recovered their significance, and geography rather than psychology began to rule the lines of war. Paris now unattainable, the channel ports, Dunkirk, Calais, and Boulogne, still naked, and lastly Antwerp, all reappeared in the field of values like submerged rocks when the tidal wave recedes. So he's saying that their value system has suddenly shifted. All up to this point, the Germans have been interested in the Schlieffen plan. And then the double encirclement vision is like the Kani and the immortality that could come out of this. They have been totally distracted by this and all secondary or subsidiary conquests that they could have, it's like, who cares about that? This is our goal. Because if they get that, all those other things come with it. But what happens when you lose your main goal? Now, I'm going to set you up for a, a, a concept here, and that this is a very spiritual concept. The enemy has a Schlieffen plan to destroy your life, to sweep in, to do a double encirclement, the ha-ha, and lead to your condemnation, to snuff out any hope of salvation, to destroy you utterly. And so he has a plot and he has a plan to do this. However, when there is a turning, when there is a a repentance, when there is a reviving, a battle of the Marne that switches the pace, that changes the day, the devil still is not going to give up. Have you ever wondered, it's like, why does the devil still attack me? I'm a Christian now. Doesn't he realize that I don't belong to him anymore? Yeah, see, I know some of you have had that thought. And yet, very similarly, he's going to pull in Eric von Falkenheim, and he's going to say, dig in and don't give up any territory. I still have territory in this person's life, and I do not want to give it up. And so when you come into the kingdom of heaven, when you have that reviving, that turn, 
where you, in the last message, we talked about the throwing down and the lifting up, the, the work of the cross, which shifts, where you see the turn of the flank of, of von Kluck, and then you strike it in the side with that power of the cross, and your life actually turns. It's changed. But then there are territories in your life that now need to be recovered because the enemy has swept in like a flood, but the Spirit of the Lord is raising up a standard against it. And yet, this is the war right here. This is what defines World War I. Up until this point, yes, we call it World War I, but it was like any other great battle in history. And it was just bigger. I mean, millions attacking millions. Now we have machine guns, now we have artillery, and it's quite dramatic and grand, and more men died. There's close to a million casualties so far in the first month. A million. That is like, no one has metrics to even measure that or to compare it to anything. This is in a whole new realm. The Russo-Japanese War, which lasted, I think, two years, lost, was it 160,000 men? Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a lot. Uh, and then uh, the, the Civil War, which was four years, was 600 to 700,000 Americans. This is like over a million in the first 30 days. <laughs> and no one has a grid for that. And if it's going to continue, how many more is it going to gobble up? So what you see the enemy doing here is recalibrating his approach. And the different things that he was not even thinking about in our life suddenly become very, very important. And he's going to stake claim to that. and He's going to hold on. He's going to try and build a stronghold or he's going to try and create influence or hold back your forward movement. So, okay, I lost you and now you're a believer, but wow, I'm going to take this territory if I can. I'm going to distract you over here. Now is when the war begins. What we understand is World War I. What World War I is historically known for. Because everything up to this point in the, the Battle of the Frontiers and the Great Retreat and the Battle of the Marne, that's World War I, and you can't take it from World War I. It's defining in World War I. However, it's totally different than the next four years. Everything in the next four years is going to go into a defensive entrenchment, and it's a totally different mindset for war and a totally different experience than any of these men, including the generals, were ever trained for. None of them have an answer for what is taking place. They've never seen anything like this. They're figuring it out as they go. So this is my re-quotation. I've sort of retaken that quote and I've trimmed it down just so you can see a few key lines. The secondary and incidental objectives, which hitherto they had rightly discarded, became of immense consequence. Places, speaking of geographical locations, recovered their significance. In other words, when you're marching through France trying to get to Paris, you could just pass through a city that has a great industrial complex, but you're not concerned about that because you're going to take Paris. And when you take Paris, that will be yours in the future anyways. But once you lose Paris, then suddenly you begin to look around and go, we need to claim that and now, lest the British or the French get it. And so suddenly the locations become very strategic. And when I was going through this, especially in seeing Winston Churchill's quote, it ignited an understanding inside of me. It's like, that is exactly what it's like in the spiritual life. In other words, the devil has you, and you're entombed in darkness, and you're lost, and your flesh is eating you up. And he, he only needs to assign some watch demons over you just to make sure, yeah, that he, they finish you off well. But there's nothing worse than someone igniting and discovering Christ, and turning from their wickedness, transforming from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son. Uh-oh. Eh, eh, eh. Now suddenly secondary incidental things become very, very important. Hold your ground. Don't let them see this. Make sure you keep them entrapped in that. Now, the believer actually has greater power. You know, the British and the French, if you were to look at it on paper at this exact juncture, have the edge to win this thing if they can hold on, because they have commonwealth nations. I mean, America, I'm sorry, well, America, yes, uh, but America's not involved in this. Great Britain has India, for instance. Have you ever counted how many men are in India? Uh, they have Canada. It's a commonwealth nation, like Australia and New Zealand. These things, they serve the British purpose. 
And France has loads of other countries too that they can draw on their soldiers and bring over the men. The men are already starting to arrive in boats. Can you imagine if you're Germany, what do you have to draw from? Germany. You have Germany, which Germany has a lot, and they're very stout men. However, it's a limited pool. Whereas this other pool, the longer it goes, what, what would you be thinking if you were a German? This is unfair. <laughs> this is not right. And then, of course, what you want to say to the Germans is, you shouldn't have invaded Belgium and France in the first place. Okay, guys, we could have solved this a different way. So the places recovered their significance, and geography rather than psychology began to rule the lines of war. These all reappeared in the field of values like submerged rocks when the tidal wave recedes. Boy, is that a great line. All right, guys, uh, this is a French location, and I put a, a little help on the screen so I could say this and impress all of you that speak French. Uh, Chemin des Dames. Chemin des Dames, I think. Uh, I, I listened to it, the pronunciation of it multiple times, and one guy said it completely different than that, one guy said it a little different than that, and then I listened to a video on it, and the guy said it like five times, and I kept writing it down a little different, fixed it. Chemin des Dames. Chemin des Dames. See? You know, there's some guys that speak French in here that are accepting my, my pronunciation, even though they are thinking they could come up here and do it better. Now, this is the prized French real estate 90 miles northeast of Paris. No one would have ever thought of this as being one of the greatest battlegrounds in history. But what's interesting is Napoleon even fought a battle here back in the day, back in the early 1800s. And now who would have guessed that because of the dynamics of where everything is flowing, that when von Kluck and von Bülow's armies begin to retreat and they're looking for a place to turn around and Eric von Falkenheim says, now, find your location and turn, that they're going to pick this one location, which is everything around this, it's flat territory in France in this exact zone. And there's this one plateau that rises up, which is known as the Chemin des Dames, and it's forested and everything around it is clear farmland. So there's one territory, and it rises, I've heard different, different numbers, five to six hundred feet. And so, which isn't a mountain, but it is significant. And so it's what we could call the high ground. And the Germans are going to entrench there. This is ideal real estate, very expensive real estate in France. And that is the territory that they are going to seize. So the Chemin des Dames is a heavily wooded ridged plateau it has exquisite views. It's uh, upwards of 600 feet above the surrounding French farmland. It's boasting, the, and it also boasts the unparalleled chalk mines 30 feet below the earth. So this is where we're going to get our name, which is the Dragon Hole. It's, to the German, it's like the Drachen Hole. And the French, it's like Cavern du Dragon. And it's actually underneath this plateau, 30 feet down, is this entire cave system. Elaborate cave system, which is big enough for men to live in. And so what you're going to have is the ultimate stronghold that is going to be created. Because the Germans have the high ground, and they have woods around them, they have hiding spots, and they're higher up, they can see down, and then everything around it has to come up the plateau. It's like a fortress but it's not made of you know, stone, it's like earth, and it's 30 feet deep, so it becomes an entire bunkhouse and, and you know, o an operating zone for the Germans. And so that's, uh, that's gonna play into this. So here's our map, Europe of 1914, and for those of you that are seeing this map for the first time, uh, that, middles, that middle reddish maroon color are the, is called the uh, Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. And they are, uh, Germany is at the top with what looks like a horse's head going nay. And uh, Russia and France and the United Kingdom are the blue. 
and Germany is going to start World War I by actually going through Belgium, which says Belge, it's right above France, and then it's going to swing down into France. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in and put Paris there, and that's what they're originally after, that star. And if I was going to show you where, the, uh, where our, our battle, the, the Battle of the Ain is going to take place, it's sort of hard because it's right next to it. It's 90 miles away. When you're looking at a map this size, it's sort of hard to show you where it actually is. So I'm going to zoom in a little more. Uh, what I call it, the sh de Dame. Now, I, I don't have my pronunciation guide on the screen. It makes me feel vulnerable. What is it? Dom. Chemin de Dom. Uh, see, I'm speaking English when I say dame. Chemin de Dom. And so you see at least the idea, and those are the rivers around, so you get sort of the idea of how this is uh, playing out. Now, I'm going to stick von Kluck's first army, which we've seen a lot of, von Kluck coming down, and he's headed straight for Paris, and then suddenly he is going to turn, and that turn is then going to empower the Allied forces to actually be able to hit him on his flank and to drive him back. And so that driving back, that retreat of the Germans is going to take them right to this line, and as a result, that's going to force another battle on September 13th. And this is called the Battle of the Aisne, when the Germans turn around and say, we're not going any further. So what's interesting is the uh, Chemin de Dame uh, is, what it means is like the path of the lady or the lady's path. So I'm changing that to make it very symbolic to uh, the bride's way. See, it's close, right? And it's interesting because this thing has two meanings, and it depends on who's occupying it. It's either the bride's way, because it's part of France. It's not meant to be in German control, but it is in German control. And when it's in German control, they call it the Drachenhol, the dragon hole. And that's exactly what it is. It's like one of these dragon holes that just gobbles up lives. And, but it's not meant to be theirs. It doesn't belong to them. It is territory that in their offensive maneuver to suffocate out the life of France, they took. And now when France is turning around and reviving, they are claiming this as theirs. And it's high ground. And as a result, it's going to create quite the consternation. So I'm going to say it this way. Everything becomes cattywampus when the Germans claim the sacred real estate. And the same is true in our life. When the devil takes territory that rightfully, rightfully belongs to Jesus Christ, things don't work. And, you know, if he's occupying your tongue, meanwhile you call yourself a Christian, you're not producing the fruit of the Spirit. Something's off. And, you know, if he possesses your sexuality... Uh, even though, hey, I'm a believer in Christ, but your sexuality is ruled by the flesh, then you have a dragon hole. It's meant to be something that is truly beautiful. The bride's way, I mean, this is, this is meant to be a high ground where we celebrate Jesus. However, it's being used in a different way, and it's creating problems. If your appetites are controlled by the flesh instead of by Jesus Christ, and you could fill in the blank. This is territory that was not meant to be his, but in that turning, you are looking to your own am ammunition. You're like, but I don't have the power to overcome it. And as a result, you oftentimes stop short and you entrench yourself as opposed to taking the territory that actually rightfully belongs to your King Jesus. So this is going to be called the Battle of the Aim. You see the dates on the screen, September 13th through September 28th, 1914. Now, I've already said that the Battle of the Marne is going to set, if it's going to be a change point of the war, well, so this is another change point. Because when they start this out, it is still movement warfare. They are going to be running up the, you know, they're going to be crossing the, the Aisne River, then they're going to be running up the plateau. In fact, the, the, the British, as is classically uh, understood, is they're, is they're about three miles away. They had this, they were using airplanes at the time, but it was like sort of a brand new concept. And they were just like surveilling. They were like seeing what the enemy was doing. But they didn't have wireless communication yet. So a guy could see something in a plane, but not be able to communicate it to anyone until he lands. 
So he's going to land in a field and he's going to just come running out of his plane and he doesn't even wait to talk to an officer. He just yells at the troops. He says, they're up ahead, thousands of them. They're on top of that plateau. You know, that, that type of a, a moment. So you, you see this engagement coming up and they are going to cross the Ain at night under the cover of darkness. They're going to make it across. It's like, yeah. And then they're going to be approaching the, the, the plateau. Meanwhile, they were covered in fog, and the sun is going to come up and burn off the fog, and they're going to be sitting ducks. And it's going to be just, I mean, tons of British soldiers are just going to be destroyed uh, in that situation. That's how the Battle of the Aisne even starts. Now, I'm Shaman de Dom. Shaman de Dom. There we see. Shaman de Dom. Look at you guys. Some of you are actually impressed. It's like Eric's getting his game on. He's got his French game on. Now I am, I'm thinking. I've been looking for a good picture of this. You know, it's like how hard is it if there is a plateau that is going up five to six hundred feet in the midst of a whole bunch of farmland? I just want to see a picture of the farmland with this plateau going up. I cannot find a picture of that. And everyone's like, and here, here it is, and when I was visiting, I saw it, and I'm like, okay, guys, am I the only one that is thinking a plateau would sort of be like this, and you know, have, and then timber on top? I'm just looking for a good picture so I could prove to you like what it looked like. British soldier coming up to it, this is what he would have seen. I cannot figure that out. Now, I'm sure right after I'm done giving this message, I'll be like, oh, I was typing it in wrong, or you know, something. It's like, but I could not find this. This is my best attempt at it. You have this wooded plateau up top, and it's almost like a fortress is what it's going to become. In other words, it didn't start this way. This is just prized real estate. And now it's going to become this territory that is going to switch hands multiple times. Now, I don't want to give anything away, but the Germans will lose it somewhere along the line, and the French will take it. And then the French will lose it to the Germans, and then the Americans will take it. I mean, this one little piece of property is going to house a lot of horrors. Let's just say it that way. So here's some interior pictures in the chalk mines. I, I, that's what my guess is that they were chalk mines. Okay, that's, I've heard at least it's said that way. I haven't really dug into it, no pun intended, uh, in any way beyond that. But not that I have great pictures for it, but it is intriguing that this is 30 feet underground. It's actually rather cold down there too. Uh, but I, I, I think it's just sort of fun to see World War I pictures like that. So the reason I'm changing the name from the Battle of the Ain to the First Battle of the Ain, because that's its official title in history, but it's funny because even when World War I starts, they're not calling it World War I. And it's just a conflict. And then you name it as you go. And each of these battles is going to inherit a name. Well, this was called the Battle of the Ain, and so I am correct in calling it that. However, after three battles of the Ain, it's going to be called the first battle of the Ain that we are currently in right now. So the first battle of the Ain, September 14th, neither side would budge. So this is a first where you have this conflict where they can't get up the plateau and the Germans won't leave the plateau and the, the French and the British can't make them leave the plateau, but the Germans can't push back in any way to get the British and the French to leave them alone. And so you have this stalemate in the midst of French territory, and it's going to lead to September 14th, Sir John French commands his men to entrench. So instead of leaving him and saying, oh, we'll just let him be then, he said, no, we're going we're gonna to entrench. Well, that's a new command. Then no one's really said anything like that before. I mean, it, me, it makes sense in military language, but w they don't have any equipment to entrench. In other words, it's not the plan to entrench. So they don't have any shovels or any pickaxes, any spades. So they go into local towns and they're trying to scavenge for something to dig a hole with. And even when they do, September 15th, soldiers begin scavenging through nearby towns for spades and pickaxes. September 15th, the first version of World War I trenches are fashioned as shallow pits in the earth. So maybe like three feet deep, and that would be like, that's a lot of work. Have you ever dug a three foot deep trench? And yet, that's nothing compared to what they are going to create. They're going to create elaborate tunnel systems behind the lines in the future, but at least seven feet deep where a man can stand upright in a trench and not feel like a, a, a bullet is going to strike him in the head, right? He has to be below it. And then they're going to put breastworks in front of that. 
So they're actually going, to, which is going to be like sandbags or something. So in other words, debris that is flying in can't just hit you either. So they're creating this elaborate system, and this is the invention of it right here. Now, some people want to argue and say the Battle of the Ain is not when trench warfare was invented. People have always, you know, dug holes to hide from incoming missiles. I'm not going to argue that, and I'm, I'm not the one responsible for declaring it, right? It's just this is historically understood as the time in which trench warfare was developed, right here in the Battle of the Aisne, in this exact situation where neither German, or neither general on either side knows what to do. They're like, ah, uh, you know, we'll just hit them. We can't hit them, sir. You know, we just lost 100,000 men trying to hit them. It's like, ah, uh, okay, well, we can't retreat. So what do we do? Well, we're, we're not going to let them move this way. And they're like, well, we're not going to let them move this way. So what do you do? They both entrench. And that's where this begins, which is going to start what's called a Western Front, where in this exact moment, they're going to recognize, what do we do? And the Germans are, you know, they're all going through all their military field manuals, and they can't figure out there's no solution to this, because this was never guessed at. This was not part of the Schlieffen plan. You know, that, that wasn't in there. This wasn't what they figured for. And the British and the French, I mean, think about the French. Their entire doctrine is the offensive. They don't entrench. They attack. And so there isn't any grid for what is taking place right now. The principle of the high ground. So famous quote from uh, Civil War, Gettysburg which I don't actually know if the quote was ever given. It's just one of those quotes that uh, somehow floats through history. But it was demonstrated. John Buford did take the high ground and keep the high ground in Gettysburg, which probably changed the entire history of the Civil War, was this exact moment. But Buford, hold the high ground. And that's critical in any battle. The high ground is essential. The Germans know that in this situation. So as they're retreating, what are they going to do? They're going to find the ultimate defensive situation to turn and fight from. And it really works well. I don't know if they knew that there was chalk mines underneath. But the odds of like picking just a plateau with this whole chalk mine system so that they can literally hide. You can hit it with artillery shell all day long and it's fine. You know, they're going to be fine in there. So, Shaman de Dom, the high ground. That's what this is. This is the high ground. So, let's, uh, I know this might seem like a little uh, bit of a tangent, but let's talk a little American history here. So, a quote from James Madison. He says, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government. Far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Now, the early American model or experiment is going to be based on something called self-government, which comes from the Bible, and it's a principle of self-control or temperance. The Greek word is egreteia. And now, one of the challenges with early American philosophy is they're right. If every one of us can self-govern, we can keep this republic. It's actually a great concept. However, it really helps to have the power of the Holy Spirit to self-govern. And so self-government, just in a concept or in an idea, is great, but many of us have a similar thing. It's like, yeah, I would like to control uh, Shimon de Dom. Yeah, that, that would be a great idea. I have no power to do it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to look at Shimon de Dom as, say, a fruit of the Spirit or a high ground, maybe even self-control specifically in our life. In other words, okay, I want that. I need that. And Jesus Christ purchased that for me. However, how do you go about getting it? So here's another quote from the Federalist Papers from James Madison. He's referring to the, Federal, the Republican form of government. So in this Republican form of government, we rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. So, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking governmentally and actually studying these things. And it is interesting because what, it, what a fascinating idea that a country is going to base its idea on the idea of freedom, personal liberty, 
which means you need to handle your personal liberty well. In other words, we're not going to just all, con- we're not going to conclude up front that you're a criminal. We want to give you the opportunity to prove to us that you're not. But if this is going to work, we need you to not abuse that privilege. So we need you to govern yourself. We're not going to create external government to govern you. We want you to govern yourself. It's a great concept, and it's based on the framework of how Christianity works, but it obviously has some vulnerabilities if people don't govern themselves. So self-government, that's not the typical word we use for it. We use self-control. That's because that's what pops up in our translations typically. And yet it's the same thing. In other words, to govern oneself. And so this idea of self-control is very, very significant, just like Shaman de Dom is. So here's Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And the way I wrote it out was very purposeful, just so you sort of see it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There it is. I see it on the list. In other words, when the Spirit of God is working inside of us, the result is this. This is what is born. This is the fruit that comes forth. What exactly is self-control? And uh, second question, is it even possible? Now, if you're in the landscape of World War I and you were to look at Shimon de Dom and say someone were to come, yeah, come to you and say, yeah, you, you should take Shimon de Dom. It belongs to you as part of the inheritance of the French. And the French guy could look back at you and go, yeah, we've tried that. <laughs> yeah, we've lost a lot of lives trying to get up that plateau, and they're entrenched. I mean, it's, they barricaded themselves in. Have you ever heard of the, the Drachenhol? Yeah, they're, they're in there and you know, coming up with all their schemes to keep us out. And it's a nightmare for us. And yet you read scripture and it's funny because even though there seems to be clear statements that this is yours, your own experience is showing that you don't have what it takes to be able to overcome and to, and to climb that plateau and to take that territory. So if you look at scripture, you have things like this, Proverbs 25, 28. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. If you don't have self-control, then the enemy has full access to your life. Boy, I, we, need, we need self-control. I, I don't want to be like a, a, a city that has walls that are broken down, that I can't rule my own spirit. And then James 3.8, many of us have sort of processed through this. It sort of ranks up there with like Romans chapter 7, which it appears at first blush, that Paul maybe doesn't have the capacity or the ability to overcome this sinful dimension of his life. I mean, wow, Paul, if Paul can't do it, who in the world do I think I am to be able to do it? And it says in James 3, 8, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so here's a World War I translation of that. No army can tame the dragon hole. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You try and go up those, th- those hills. You try and take that territory. I've tried. Yeah, it's full of deadly poison. It's called bullets. And they hurt. And they kill. In other words, this is a territory that used to be the bride's way and now is the dragon hole. I like it when it's the, sort of the German sound, which I don't know that I speak it very well, but it's still sort of cool. The dragon hole. Doesn't that just sound uh, insidious and evil? The dragon hole. Oh, I, I, J.R.R. Tolkien should have used that somewhere. Uh, shouldn't that have been in one? Like, can't you just see one of the characters in one of those stories going, oh, no, it's the Drakken Hall. Yeah, see? You guys need to get into the emotion of this. There's a lot going on. J.R.R. Tolkien was in World War I. He was watching these things, and I'm, I'm saddened that he missed that. So self-control. First, what it is not. When you hear the term self-control, what is your instinct? It's funny, but we all have the same instinct, especially when we grow up sort of in a Veggie Tales generation. Now, I don't want to throw Veggie Tales under the bus, okay? Not necessarily. However, Veggie Tales and many other children's projects espouse moral virtues, but they don't teach the child actually how to employ it. For instance, they tell a child that they should be self-controlled, as an example. 
and a child learns how important self-control is. They could even learn that it's a fruit of the Spirit, but that doesn't necessarily translate to them in any other way but that they need to work up self-control in their life. So I know self-control is important, so what do I need to do? I need to obviously have self-control. It's the same way we treat love. You're supposed to love. And so the little child is like, I need to love. And they dig into their own pockets and try and find love. And it's just not there. They have a human form of love that they oftentimes mistake for the heavenly version. And so they whip up sort of this vaporous thing, this wisp uh, of love, which has a, has a, a bit of similarity. And it usually is able to be you know, contrived and done when it's family and it's people that you really like and it's someone who does a nice thing to you and you love them back for it. But it's not the heavenly version. And self-control is very similar. In other words, you can learn to control yourself at a certain level. And you can do studies on people that the shame, in, in a culture of shame, uh, a shame-based culture, probably a better way of saying it, that there are certain controls that are just built into it that someone will not do something if they know someone's watching them. In other words, if no one was watching, then you don't have the control. But when you're in certain environments, uh, yeah, you won't do that. And so you control yourself. See, there's something obviously in you that can say no to it because you just said no to it, but it actually wasn't what God intends to control you. It was the principle and the power of shame that was controlling you, that you don't want to appear to be weak. You don't want to appear to be lustful. You don't want to appear to be mean. And so when people are watching, suddenly your game changes. And suddenly you act different. But that's not what God wants to set us free to do. What he has actually accomplished is far beyond that. But when we think about what self-control is, many of us think it's us controlling ourself. Which, I mean, you have to admit, that's fairly easy to come to as a conclusion when it's called self-control. That means self is controlling. And that's part true. However, there is a dimension to it that needs to be unlocked to make it fly. So here is us trying to control ourselves, and Paul is going to be very clear on the fact that this isn't how it is done. Colossians 2, 21, and then verse 23. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. When we try and create an infrastructure of control, because it's like, I have to get this back, we're going to find that we're going to die on the plateaus of the Shimon de Dom. Did I get that right again? We're going to die on the, on the slopes uh, on the way up. We can't overcome it in and through rules, in and through regulations, if I just don't touch this, if I just don't look at this, if I just, and we have our list, and lists have wisdom to them. In other words, there are certain things that if you don't do them, you are more likely to succeed. However, those aren't dealing with the root problem. It's sort of like in World War I, acting like, okay, the Germans have Shimon de Dom, and yet we're going to act like they, they don't have any control, and so we're going to keep working in the rest of France. Meanwhile, they really do have a stronghold there. And the only way to deal with that stronghold is to drive out the Germans. And there's something that Jesus Christ has done that actually drives out the Germans. And you cannot take Shimon de Dom in any easy fashion in your own natural strength. Self-control. Now what it is. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Now some of you could go, I already know that. However, what is it? Well, to say that it is a fruit that is born by the Holy Spirit instead of by self-effort is important, though. You need to recognize that this is a working of God. This is not just a working of man. We participate in self-control, but it is something that we need God in order to do. Now, if any of you have gone through training at Ellerslie, which most of you in this room have been here when I talk about the Glaston office, remember when I described the, the chapel as my body? It's sort of an awkward visit to the body of Eric Ludi. And in it, there's this Glaston office, but this whole body is being controlled by the flesh. It's called Old Eric. 
And old Eric isn't very pleasant. And old Eric has a problem. And that is that old Eric is sitting on the throne of his life. It's called the director's chair. And so everything that's happening in this body, which is like a factory, is producing bad fruit. And the reason is, and we get down to brass tacks, Eric is in a seat that he was never intended to be in. I, as an individual, was never supposed to take that seat, which we could call a throne, the chair of control. That's not my seat. And as a result, when I sat in that seat, I empowered something known as the flesh. And as a result of that, I'm not actually the one in control of my factory, even though I'm the one responsible for what's happening inside of it. Oh, woe is me. Who can save me from this body of death, says Paul, to the exact same scenario. And yet, Paul is also going to say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, we have been saved from this. Jesus comes in and deals with the flesh's control over our life. And one of the other things he does is he sets us free from that seat. So what he then says after he unglues us and removes the super glue connection, unties us, you know, because we were truly locked into that seat and couldn't even figure out how to get out. But from the outside in, he rescues us. But many of us, though we have been set free from the seat, never step down from that seat. Self-control, by definition, would be you stepping down from that seat and allowing Jesus to have it. Now when Jesus has it, he gives authority to you to now command your body and to bring it into subjection. However, your authority is not found in your own pockets. It is found in his position in your life, which is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So his authority is then bequeathed to you, and then you wield that authority over this body. And so your sexuality, which has always controlled you and been like a shaman, shaman de dam, did I get that right? It's been like a shaman de dam high point in your life, and you've been dying on the slopes of it. It's been a rock and hole to you all these years. Suddenly has no authority and power to continue in that place. But your authority and power is not human military strength anymore. It is now God power. And as a result, you can break through that stalemate and shoo the enemy off that plateau. And that is how the gospel works. But you need to understand that it is not something derived from your willpower. It is something, something derived from his ability. It's called grace. He has authority over that real estate. And if you walk in agreement with him as opposed to trying to fight it in your own strength, you actually do break through. The change of battle when the Schlieffen plan fails. The devil has a Schlieffen plan, a desire to take you, to destroy you, and to eternally condemn you. That's his design. And he has the upper hand in, in a strange sense, is the way it feels, because we start out in that position. In other words, we are already in the great retreat to begin with. It's like, wow, I can't overcome this. This enemy is coming in like a flood. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. And in a strange way, he always turns the flank of Kluk and always creates an opening for a soul to awaken and respond. And that crosswork is what turns it. The enemy is already, in a sense, turned in our life. And the flank is open, but we need to be believers. We need to trust that Christ's victory is sufficient to change the course of this battle, to change the course of this nation if you're France. And yet, the enemy is very, very good at entrenching himself and trying to act like, hey, I already left, you beat me, oh, that's too bad. And then meanwhile, hold as much territory of France that he still can. And many of us have fallen for it, where the enemy has this whole upper, you know, northeastern sector of France now, and we're just like, well, at least he doesn't have the southwestern. Uh, uh, chunk. And we're like, oh, praise God. But there's a whole chunk in our life that is actually going to create hazards for us until we drive him out. The first thing David is going to do when he comes into his kingship, the thing Saul didn't do, is he's going to extend his borders to the borders of promise, the, the borders that God promised Israel. The first thing he's going to do, he's going to like, I'm taking the territory that belongs to my God, that he said was his. And God 
blesses them in it. That's part of what we need to do too when Jesus Christ changes our life is we need to change the borderlines to actually match what his promise is in our life. That is not the enemy's territory. I don't care how many times you have tried to go up the plateaus of Shimon de Dom and failed in your own strength. We're doing it again, but this time we're doing it in God's strength. From the moment when the German hopes of destroying the French armies by a general battle and thus of ending the war at a single stroke had definitely failed, all the secondary and incidental objectives which hitherto they had rightly discarded became of immense consequence. As passion declined, material things resumed their values. The struggle of armies and nations having failed to reach a decision, places recovered their significance and geography rather than psychology began to rule the lines of war. Paris now unattainable, the channel ports Dunkirk, Calais, and Boulogne, still naked, and lastly Antwerp, all reappeared in the field of values like submerged rocks when the tidal wave recedes. So right at the conclusion of this, and this is where we're moving in, in the war right now, is called the race to the sea. So if you're familiar with World War I, this is a whole zone of World War I, which is still in 1914, but it's interesting, just getting into the mindset of it. Remember, you're a general, and you're, all your training is that your goal, you're, you're trying to outflank your opponent. That's just what you do in war. It's movement warfare. And so they entrench themselves on both sides here in the Aisne. Now the Germans are thinking this through. And they're like, what are we supposed to do now? We just lost the Schlieffen plan. We lost all our momentum, all the surprise, all the advance notice. I mean, now we're in a situation where we have to outflank them. Well, there's no place to outflank them down up into the Alps of Switzerland. And that's been stalemated for a long time, just constant battle along uh, Alsace and Lorraine. And every, both, you could just see it. If this was a movie, you'd see the French look towards the ocean, and you see the Germans look towards the ocean, and then they'd look across the table at each other, and then they'd both start running. They're both going to try and outflank the other along this edge up to the ocean. They're not really racing to the sea. They're racing to outflank each other, but they're going to end up at the ocean. When you reach the ocean, there's no way to outflank, which what I'm describing is going to create a front and it's called the Western Front that will last for four years. There's going to be a line that is going to be created here that no one can budge through. And millions of men are going to die along. But it all starts because it's old school generalship trying to solve a problem of modern warfare. We need to get around the flank. And so they're doing it. One guy called it a crab walk all the way along. I don't know what, exactly what that looks like, but they're trying to both outflank each other, and there's all sorts of little mini miniature battles along the way that are ultimately going to lead us to Belgium, and I already gave you a heads up, if you remember one of my messages on Albert, of what's going to happen when they get right to the end into the ocean, and they're trying to turn the flank, and the Belgians and the French are trying to hold the line. I don't, I don't, I mean, I st still sort of want to, if you didn't hear it, I sort of want to savor it again and maybe uh, go back and revisit it. It's a good story. So the race to the sea begins. The reinvention of warfare. Warfare is being reinvented in, in front of the world right in this time. And most people would say it took too long to reinvent because they're going to lose millions of men in trying to figure it out. And they're going to make the same mistake over and over again. They're going to try and take old warfare tactics and apply them. But what they're failing to realize is that real men have to go into a trench. They have to jump out of that trench, go through barbed wire, somehow get past barbed wire while machine guns are firing at them. And it's like, have we thought this through? But the generals live 10 miles back in chalets. And they have the niceties of life still. Everything is beautiful for the generals. It's the men on the front that are actually experiencing the horrors of World War I. The second phase of the war now opened. The French, having heaved the Germans back from the Marne to the Aisne and finding themselves unable to drive them further by frontal attacks, continually reached out their left hand in the hopes of outflanking their opponents. Here's how Barbara Tuckman says it. After the incomplete victory of the Marne, there followed the German retreat to the Aisne, the race to the sea for possession of the channel ports, the fall of Antwerp, and the Battle of Ypres, where officers and men of the BEF held their ground, fought literally until they died, and stopped the Germans in Flanders. Uh oh, I did. it's sort of a spoiler alert there, but maybe you won't understand what it said. That's uh, good stuff. 
So here's the race to the sea. So that's our close-up on the map. Remember that I showed you that we have uh, the Sh Shimon de Dom. Did I say that correct? Shimon de Dom. I really need my, I should have had a cheat sheet up here on my hand as I was doing it. And so there's a little closer, and then we're going to see uh, both the Germans and the French and the British are like, we need, we need to outflank them. We can't do it to the right, so we're going to do it to the left. At least that's from the French side. From the Germans, it's the opposite direction. And they're, then they're going to go all the way up, and that little corner of Belgium right there is going to become critical, and because that's where the channel ports are. And this is going to be that battle with Albert uh, at, uh, called Isère, if you guys remember uh, that battle. Oh, it's a great moment. But there's all sorts of key things that are going to happen in here. And ultimately, that's going to create, if you see that line, that's gonna, it's not a perfect line. If, you, if you're really good with World War I, you're going to say, there, the, the line goes like this. It's close, okay? It's a generalization. I'm doing it in Keynote with straight lines. It's not very easy. So I can't get my bend line in Keynote to work. I click on it and try and bend it, and it deletes every time. So there's probably, so I probably need Josh Kinnebrew to help me figure out my, my curved line so I could make it all cool and make it uh, the exact way it's supposed to be. But for right now, you guys get the general idea. It's basically along the line, but that little sector, Belgium is German now. It's taken over by the Germans, except for that little corner up there and that northern piece of France. Could you imagine being a French person and being stuck in German territory for four years? This is horror for those French people up in that northern, northeastern sector. All right, guys, let's pray. Father, I ask that you would train us in what it means to take the high ground. Lord, to not accept the enemy's guff. Lord, that part of our life that the enemy has tried to seize and tried to use is meant to be the bride's way instead of the dragon hole. And Lord Jesus, I pray that these areas of our life would be touched by your Holy Spirit and that you would rectify what the enemy has attempted to destroy. We are the redeemed of Jehovah. We are the twice born. We have been given the authority of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would train us as the body to bring our bodies into subjection and to wield the name of Jesus. As we submit to the Lord, we can resist the devil and he will flee. So, Lord, train us in battle. Teach us to win this. Teach us to utilize your victory on the cross. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we ask this.